It is too far away from the Earth. Where we're putting the Webb telescope is a place called L2. And uh, if you think of here's the Earth, here's, here's the Sun, um, L2 is on the other side, a million um, miles away from the Earth. The full moon is between us and L2. That's where James Webb will be. It's four times the distance to the moon. Fifty years ago, they say we went looking for the moon, and we found the Earth. Yeah, right? that's true. That picture of the Earth—that was really the beginning of the modern environmental movement, right there. One of my favorite little lakes. There's an eagle circling around in front of us. In grad school, I asked the question, what does the Earth look like from very far away when you can't see the continents and the oceans? And can you actually tell that there is life on that planet? So we looked at the moon not too many days after new moon, when you can just first start to see that thinnest crescent right at sunset, you'll notice that the dark part of the moon is also visible because the Earth is shining on that part of the lunar surface. So if you take a telescope and you look at that light, it's Earth light all jumbled up together. It's the land, it's the ocean, it's the clouds, the air. And when you spread that light out and look at it, you can plainly see the squiggly line that this is a planet that has a definite clear oxygen line. And there's definitely carbon dioxide and there's methane. Those signals were all tangled up together in the colors of the Earth. And that was what we called the spectrum but, of a um, planet. Do you guys know each other? Have you met you two? <laughs> no, <laughs> it was just like for a few years. Coincidentally, we happened to be in the same room and decided, okay, let's edit this film. <laughs> Why not? You, I, hey, I can edit. You can direct. Let's do something. The kind yeah. of amazing thing is, I actually haven't seen Sabina. I haven't seen you like even a vision of you for like. God, it feels like almost a year. It's crazy. We really haven't. We've talked on the phone, but we haven't done a Zoom call together. So, oh, it's yeah. really you're you're bringing us together again. This is wonderful. Well, or this South is, by Southwest is too indirectly. Right, um, right. But uh, where you're going? Let's mention where you're going to have a world premiere of the, your new documentary, "The Hunt for Planet B." Uh, we'll just start. Um, this is my show, by the way. Anyway, it sort of starts usually like people say, "Did we? Are we starting?" And I'm like. <laughs> oh yeah yeah we started like 10 minutes okay ago. it just sort of happens um and uh but i wanted to say uh, i wanted to actually ask for personal just interest how did you originally you your first project together was my arctic but i don't think i, I yes. ever knew how you guys met originally and or just ended up working together which has been now a long lasting relationship it has it has sabina i how, how do you remember it this will be a he, well, should, he well, said she said thing well, oh there was Argue. this place. There was this place in Soho called Media Works, and it was the place where all the documentary filmmakers went to work when they didn't have a job. Like in between, oh, okay. real good jobs, we went to Media Works, and Media Works was like a, and in, they made industrials, and sometimes they made you know some a little bit more interesting films. Basically, it was the money, the you know, the place with the money jobs. And so I went to work there and Nathaniel, I think you were, I, I would just freelance and, and sometimes end up there. I and mean, Nathaniel actually was on, you know, was hired by MediaWorks. I don't think you were freelance. Yes. You were actually with on the thing. And then one day Nathaniel came into the room where I was editing and said, you know, I have this project that I've been working on for very long or whatever, or for the, a couple of years and, you know, about my father and we started talking and 
And he said, you know, can I show you something? And we were looking at, I think we looked at the scene or at some footage of, of Harriet uh, that you shot uh, in, the, in Philadelphia. I'm trying to think, you may have already had shot Philip Johnson. I think and so. I think so. Yeah. Same time period. And so we looked at it and I said, oh, it was really, it looks really fabulous. And I didn't know about Nathaniel's father. And he told me and, you know, we just, I was just really interested in the story and in the project in the architecture anyway. My, my uncle was an architect, so I had some sort of a connection to the theme also. And then, and and then we decided, okay, let's try sort of in between. Like we didn't even, you know, let's just do a scene. Or, or Nathaniel, I think we discussed about that you had a, a thought of going to shoot a, ne a next um, section. And then we said, okay, let's just go ahead and shoot it. It was sock. Yeah, that's right. Different, we talked about all the different past scenes that he could shoot there. And then come back and let's cut a scene and just sort of see how it works. And then the first sock scene was a really long, like probably a half an hour scene, including a lot of elements that are never made it into the final film. But that's sort of how it started. And then we were on and off because that was, you know, how documentaries found their financing. You find a little and then you stop and then you right. have to work for money and then you find some more and you go ahead. And so I think we worked over the course of I don't know you would probably know better how long probably I think it was it was about 18 months and for me I mean MediaWorks was it was a magical place for me because the the people who ran it were really interested in filmmaking and really sort of fostered this environment where we could try things and they supported that and it was really it was quite wonderful and you had a little room in the back and we did you know we did some kind of amazing industrials actually they were quite the one for the child study center was really a, a wonderful piece that was our first piece we did together and the thing I remember from the start you mentioned the sock piece um and it's pretty much the way we've continued to make movies together ever since which is we're always looking for scenes and and really kind of allowing the film to grow from from the scenes rather than from some kind of you know overall concept to start with it really it needs to be bottom it, up it's, in a way. yeah it's, it's, it's bottom well yeah and, and it's and it's characters i mean both sabina and i love drama and you know love the theater and so we're, we're always looking for something that um rather than an idea or a concept or i mean i remember having all these cards on the wall at media works and you know this it had to how things had to fit together and everything and sabina just says you know well just no just go just just, just go shoot and i really hadn't i'd done several of several of these things before but i was really getting stuck in my head and and so ever since it's been really this experience of of going to film things and seeing what speaks to you and then creating, you know, creating something which has some dramatic integrity to it and building the film from there. Um, and that's that's how we made also the price of everything and and how we made this film too. Over but but it takes time and it takes yeah. it takes, you know, it really doesn't work. <laughs> exa exactly. And that, many things risk that yeah, that's there. A that, lot of risk. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but that's also the excitement. And I think that's the that's where documentaries can be so thrilling because you know, to watch them, you don't know where it's going to go. And that's that excitement of, of making them too. And right. it's scary. It's really scary. But I think, you know, Sabina and I have a, have a shorthand now that we, we, you know, many times we'll screen something, just look at each other and it'll, you know, we just don't have to say anymore. It's just like, no, that was, you know, that goes and that's okay. That's all right. Um, but to get yeah, to that. Yeah, point, some of my favorite documentaries have, have been um, where, you know, you're on this, where you know the filmmaker just all of a sudden there's like a deus ex machina well almost the opposite where mm. like all of a sudden the story just goes off in some direct, direction unpredictable of course or you know and it's you're you're wondering is the is the documentary ma filmmaker or the storyteller is going to go with that or are they sticking to the original you know are, are, right. or are they open to going this other completely other direction and and more often than not at the good ones you know they they just sort of take that leap and, but uh, you, you, you actually like these moments that are that are included in the film where you feel the film shifting, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's what you're saying. And I, and I love that, too. And that I mean, it takes a kind of courage to put that in there because yes. the tendency is to say, well, no, everything has to be, you know, totally clear and worked out. 
Right. And now you don't know, is this going to take another five years to tell this story? If I go, exactly. you don't, or is this going to cost us how, you know, how we're going to budget it? All these things come into, are we going to have to travel or we, who knows? Right. Um, right. And of course, life is like that. So that's why, that's you know, documentaries when they're, when they're made in that manner can really feel that they unfold the way life unfolds, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. When well, did this documentary have any surprises? Did you go into it, for instance, thinking you were going to primarily tell sort of a, 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 I mean, a, the majority of the scientists in this film, the primary ones that you you sort of were following are females. I don't know if that was your intention from the moment go or. To that was something we very much. I mean, we that was something that really was conceptual that both Sabina and I decided this is something that we want to do. And it was really, but, but it came from the, from came from material. It was that these incredibly compelling astronomers were women. And uh, so that, I mean, that became a major, uh, obviously a major, a major through line of the story. But one, one thing that did surprise us was the importance of the climate march. That was something that really, I think, right, Sabina, wasn't that something that we, that kind of, we didn't start in with that. Yeah, well, we didn't start with it, in with that, but we always knew that there was the environmental aspect to it. Yes, I mean, uh, it, that 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 also would really this idea of looking out and finding something, and through the course of looking out, tr turning your gaze back and realizing, you know, realizing what this what our planet really means and, and the importance of it and how unique it is. And I think, so we wanted to bring that out and, and the scientists often refer to it, but, but until the climate march was shot, we, we realized that, you know, until that happened, we, we were sort of, it was almost um, a too, too loose of a theme and that really nailed it to becoming something very urgent and, in the now right yeah but that was something that you know i mean one thing is that when you have events that occur during the production cycle that 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 sort of where, where your production coincides with world events that's yeah. that's a remarkable thing and that was something that happened we knew we wanted the the idea as sabina has said of that by looking out you also come to understand by looking outward into the universe for other worlds, you come. To, one comes to understand the Earth in a new, with a new perspective. We knew we wanted that, but sort of how to achieve that isn't necessarily easy. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the fact that these climate marches were happening um, around the world, and that it, and that was really right outside the window of our office. We couldn't not be there. And then suddenly that became something that also got picked up by. The, um, the women who were talking about Trappist and what would they think of us? I mean, one of the questions becomes of where would we actually place the climate march? And that was something that we didn't have an answer for for a long time. I mean, it was early and then it was late and it was different places, but it, it organically found its home when uh, the, the team um, that is working on the Trappist, particular Trappist planet, Trappist 1E, when they were talking about it and saying, you know, well, gee, if they were there looking at us, you know, they would be they would be receiving messages from 39 years ago, of course, because it's this distance. But, you know, they would be watching us and watching the way our our climate is changing and such. And what would they be thinking of us? So suddenly mm -hmm. there was this thing of and, and one of the people, one of the one of the women says, you know, what are they doing down there is what this you know, a, a fictional, an imaginary being on Trappist would be saying about us. And that was a perfect way to segue into the climate marches that are happening right now. Right. So you find those moments and, and that was tricky because we moved it in different places and it didn't work. It didn't resonate right. But then suddenly it did. Yeah. Like, I mean, you always try to find obviously in, in a scene sort of, you know, ins and outs that, that connect beautifully to something else. And, I mean, just to come back to also some, so the, you know, some of these moments in documentary filmmaking where magically <laughs> things happen that you actually, you know, sometimes magically don't happen, but sometimes they magically happen. But for example, when you went to shoot Maggie up in Wisconsin, there was this gigantic storm that knocked right. everything out right. of the park that was, you know, on, you know, unprecedented or hadn't happened so long. So, you know, that right. again, Real we life. could have said, right. 
we could have said, okay, well, it doesn't really belong, you know, what I'm, you know, whatever we talk about the bees and all that, but then the storm and the visuals of it and, and the people worried about it increases also the drama of it all. I think, you know, you always try to find moments that, that help it, I, to intensify the drama that's going on. And so that was a perfect moment that really helped us, you know, wrap, you know, and also where we placed it, it's sort of like, you know, the next, we're now, it's coming closer, you know, the inevitable is moving closer and closer. Mm. So. So I, I, you know, on the surface, the documentary, well, beyond the surface too, but it's about the web telescope, which is an, it's essentially an observatory, right? But it's going to be able to see beyond uh, the, our universe. Well, you'll see to the, see very close to the beginning of time, very close to the beginning of time. Back. I don't know what that is. See, see yeah, here's okay. the thing. As a science fiction <laughs> fan, I would, right. and I'm doing my Bill Shatner, as I say, spot, <laughs> I, to go boldly go where no man or woman has gone before. But, um, and right. I, you know, we're thinking, like, I look at it as, as this thing where, uh, you know, these scientists are looking for life in habitable places where we can maybe survive because we're, hmm. you know, we've destroyed our we're just in the process of kind of making our current planet uh, uninhabitable, you know, so that's kind of the, but the, you know, and then there's this beautiful aspect that the wit, it's of course it's women who are, who are doing the, this work because women are give life, you know? So it's, it seems like the natural order of things is um, my mm. kind of interpret. Well, it's also, I mean, there's also a whole, a whole angle to that, which is that, you know, of course, astrophysics for years, has been dominated by men and and sort of in a sense that the lone genius model is something that has is kind of many times it's kind of the vision of what we have of what science is but that has radically is radically changing and has radically changed in the sense that that now most of the really really effective work in science or a great deal of it is being done by these teams mm -hmm. and the more diverse the better Right. Um, sure, and, sure. and that that is getting the most effective science, that that is, that is getting the best results. And so in a world like exoplanets, which is also, there's another reason too, which is that exoplanet world looking for these new worlds. Exoplanets are a really new discovery. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't know that there were other planets around stars. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there were one or two known, but, but the, the majority of them came with the launch of the Kepler Space Telescope and suddenly there are planets everywhere. So it's a new field. So there, there weren't the entrenched sort of, um, you know, the the entrenched structures that that really was a real glass ceiling for for uh, for for women, you know, before, uh, and that's uh, that's only beginning. We have, there's still a very long way to go. You talk to people in the field, a long way to go. Um, it it weren't, we ain't there yet. But but the idea that a field like exoplanets was much more open. So people, younger people and, and, you know, large, larger groups were able to join and were not kept out. Um, that's a really a sort of a wonderful thing that I think we've also captured a bit, this demographic shift mm -hmm. in science sure, um, and in astrophysics, that's which that's is really awesome. exciting. Yeah. And they're all real, you know, human beings. They're, have their, you, you know, like, I, maybe you're getting to this, like men have an easier time to sort of um, presenting as just scientists <laughs> that's their entire identity if they have families it's uh it's kind of just background whereas you know it's front and center with uh, these some of these scientists that we, we see you know in their mm. relationships and their families you know that's healthy that's a good way to live i mean right his work well it, it it it's it was amazing to see the group of people also who are building a telescope and it's not you know it's also the engineers and one one thing that 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 we really enjoyed in cutting the film was to be able to show a mission like the Webb telescope actually happening in real time. You know, so many, so, so often a science, you know, a science-based film um, is about sort of known knowledge. It's, it's a way of presenting things we already know. Um, and the fun of making this film was this is something that isn't finished yet. It's, it's happening as you're watching. This telescope is coming together like some great cathedral or something like that. And there are a lot of unknowns. You know, will it work? What right. will what what will happen? You know, there are problems that are encountered in the film. We have 
the moments where they have difficulties with their tests and such like that. And that's really the way these projects come together. It's not like this receive knowledge top down. This is reaching out into the dark to try to understand how to do things that have never been done before and try to discover things that we don't even know what we're going to find. You know, you ask someone like, like John Mather, the, 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 um, the, the uh, head of the mission from the scientific standpoint. And, you know, he says, listen, if I could tell you the most exciting thing we're going to find, I, I, I would, but, but I don't know what that's going to be, you know, and that's, that's, that's part of what we wanted to capture too, is this, this unknowability, right. you know, just kind of reaching out into the dark feeling of building this thing. We don't, you know, we don't know yet what we're going to. It just so happens another. The, the, historically speaking, another thing women are better at not knowing every all the answers or everything. <laughs> well, well, yes, and that's so that that also relates oh. to the idea of time, which is also sort of a, 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 an overreaching th theme of the film, which women seem to have a better you know, way right. working with, you know, things take time and, and we see the different generations that all have worked on this thing. And, and, and we see the frustration that happens with things not, you know, coming together as when we want them. And this idea to really think about time, time passing time, how long do we have on this earth, you know, mm -hmm. You know, everybody dies at some point, you know, will we die, you know, so it's... I get it's, carried away, and not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, as for a science fiction person, probably, yeah, not everybody. Waiting for all of us. I'm not, actually. Uh, the, let's just remind people, it's called The Hunt for a Planet B. It's premiering at uh, South by Southwest um, in the uh, documentary spotlight category. It's, it's wor the world premiere of the documentary. Um, directed by Nathaniel Kahn, edited by Sabine Crambuel. Um, let's just go. Uh, I'm having a hard time wrapping around my head. Just to go back to something you said, Nathaniel, um, the Webb telescope, hypothetically, you'll be able to see at the, as far back as the beginning. I, I have a hard time understanding time as a as a, a, a as, as some sort of dist way of looking in back and how do you how do you do that i mean because sure. i'm only um, with distance like you see far right well the reality is that that light you know light takes time to get yeah it's really fast but it takes time so therefore i'm not really okay. seeing you now light, hence i'm light seeing years. right i'm seeing the way you were so when you look at the moon you're seeing it you're seeing it about a second and a half or so where, where it was a second and a half ago it the the sun the light from the sun takes eight minutes to get from the sun to us. So, so if the sun were to burn out right now, it would take eight minutes for us to, but it's not going to happen. But if it did, it would take eight minutes for us to know that. Eight so minutes as, to find a flashlight. I understand. It, exactly. Time to find a flashlight. But the, so the point is the further, the further out you look, the also the further back in time that you see. So as we look towards the very edge of the universe, we're seeing back 13.5 billion years ago as we look out 13.5 billion light years out we're looking back in time 13.5 billion years so um the universe is a little bit older than that but but in the very beginning uh, you know the big bang so to say mm -hmm. right um uh nothing nothing could be seen for for a little while and and um when it emerges from this period called the dark ages it's when the very first stars form the very first galaxies form those things have never been seen. The Hubble Space Telescope looked out and saw saw pretty close to that, but couldn't actually get all the way all the way back there. Couldn't see far far enough out there. And it's because of this thing called the redshift. The light actually becomes just like a, a siren that goes past you. The sound goes down. You know, it goes beep boo beep boo beep boo beep as it goes away. Right. Yeah. The, the, the same thing happens with light, only it gets redder. So it gets redder and redder and redder and redder until you can't see it red anymore. It becomes infrared. So the Webb telescope is an infrared telescope. It can see beyond the red to the very, very, very red shifted galaxies and stars that are at the very beginning. So these are things we've never seen before. So the telescope is really an origins machine. It's, it's addressing the biggest questions we have. How did the universe begin? Where did we come from? And this question, which we engage profoundly in the film, is are we alone? But those three questions, you know, where did we come from? How did the universe begin? Are we alone? Those are huge. And to think that we are at this moment, at this very moment, 
like able to ask those questions and get some answers is astonishing. It's easy to think, well, every time is like another time. No, this time is really special. So, you know, we're on the verge of that. Um, and I think that's one of the things in making this film, I think both Sabina and I really loved being, you know, in the presence. There's something very positive about this. There's something very wonderful that people can get together and, and build an instrument like that. And the women who are, who are the astronomers who are going to use it to look at these exoplanets, that people are getting together just to ask these questions. That's kind of what we do is we do so many things as human beings and some of them are great and some of them are not great. But one of the things we do that is great is to be able to ask these huge questions and this, this endless curiosity that we have. So being able to sort of navigate that world when we were making this film together, um, in spite of all the difficulties of putting films together. And it's really hard, of course, as, you know, as anybody who's made a film knows, it's tough. And there are days when you think this is never going to work. But then, you know, but it's wonderful to work on a film like this, which has such sort of positive vibes to it. This is an incredible project that is, you know, a worldwide project. NASA's working with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency and people from 44 different countries getting together. You know, that's like the best of what we do. And so it, I think it was, didn't you feel that Sabina, that it was fun to be part of that? Yeah, no, I mean, the idea of it being so positive, also this, you know, I think at the end of the film, you also feel that anybody really can go and look out into the sky and wonder and, and ask these questions. And it sort of the film has a way, I mean, it was important for us to not make this, you know, this is a different science film. It's a film, the way we try to talk about science is some is, is a, you know, in the film was trying to make it understandable for about anybody because, because the idea is really, to include people and inspire people. And that's what we want to do. You know, that's part of this making the film and, and, and part of the team, the team of the women part, you know, I think so, so that was always, so in this way, the film is not just a science, you know, a typical science film for geeks, but also really for anybody who wants to just, you know, think about those basic questions. And as I always th say, you know, um, it's not, it's not something foreign. We're actually in earth is, is in space or we're in mm -hmm. space. We're not space. Isn't what's just out there. we actually are in space. So our planet is just true. any like any other place. And we're aliens to some, but to some other form of life. That's true. Uh, we're the aliens. So, you know, um, I always try to put things in a certain context, uh, you know. But that's a that that's something we wanted to achieve too a little bit is or or to 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 kind of remind people of is that we are as you say we're in space we yeah. we are we are a, a very small planet um, and we try to play with that perspective too. There's a moment where you see the Earth from the Moon right before um, one of the characters Maggie is you know talking about this this image, this key image, when we first saw the earth from the moon and the, and the, and the earth rise, and it was kind of the beginning of the environmental movement. And it, but it's very much this idea that one of the things we wanted to do with the film is to, is to play with perspectives so that, so that, you know, maybe by looking for other worlds out there and wondering what they're like and looking and thinking about the qualities that they would have this, these worlds on Trappist, it, it gives us a new way to look at or a fresh way to look at our own our own planet, our own little fragile world, and that's not political, and it's not you know that that's not that's 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 just it's just the fact of it. We are this tiny marble suspended in space, and at this moment, it's the only place in the universe that we know that there is life. We're looking for it elsewhere. <laughs> it's, the statistics seem to favor that there is life out there. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the known universe. But as of this moment, we are the only place in the universe which we know has life. So, you know, either way, if we're alone, my God, we're, you know, we're the most, we, we are the most precious thing anyway, because it's all we have. But, but if we're alone, imagine how important it is. And if we're not alone, imagine how important it is. So, so either way, we're at this moment where we're able to kind of ask this question 
not theoretically, but for real, we can go find out. And that's something else. We talked a lot about this in the film. Um, the, the key, one of the key concepts is this idea of observation that, and Matt Mountain, who's one of the scientists who talks about Galileo and flies to Galileo to see Galileo's home and everything and where he was, where Galileo was, was you know, put in under house arrest for the last years of his life for simply saying that the earth was, you know, going around the sun. <laughs> he was put away for that, right? And, you know, talk about the suppression of science, you know. Um, so, uh, but, but this idea that what Matt says is that we have to make the observation. Don't, don't, you know, don't read it in a book, go find out. And that's, I mean, that's, once again, that's this great instinct that human beings have. Let's find out. Let's, let's ask the hard questions and then go find out. No. Uh, there's, uh, if that does, if, if, if anybody watches this and then doesn't run to South by Southwest, meaning go to their <laughs> living room. Uh, right. Go to their living room. I know it's so hard. We, um, we so wish we could all be together. The fun of I know. being an independent film. Well, actually, you know, yeah. interestingly, it was sort of a, a strange, I mean, again, it's like how things coincide. The fact that we were finishing the film in the, during the pandemic, and, you know, remember this moment when every sort of the earth stood still almost, you know, for the first time the smog lifted and we could see the sky and we could see the stars. And it was so interesting to see also how many people started getting telescopes and, you know, you saw, you know, people were looking up at the sky and, and, and the sky and became... And treadmills and, you well, know, weights. No. <laughs> But yeah, well, up here, you know, where I am, we can see the stars every night, but yeah, regardless of, a, of how many. Yeah, but there. it was also one of these moments where, you know, we, we you know, contemplating, we, we had time to contemplate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and now as on the cusp of uh, hopefully the other end of this pandemic, the film will have its first audiences. And I wish, wish you guys a lot of luck with the film. And when maybe when it's ready for uh, a proper theatrical, we'll do this. We could do this again. We'll just we love that. I'll, I'll trans transcribe what we just did, and I'll send it to you. And we can just read off the. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, but by that point, by that point, we'll know we'll know some more things, right? Oh, maybe we'll that's more right. things, and we'll be, and we'll be closer to launch. I mean, that's the excitement. The count the countdown has begun. The telescope actually launches at the end of. Uh, it's right at the October. end of October. October, yeah. it's only, only uh, months away. Months, months away. away. Yeah. Well, this was it's really it's fun talking about the you know it's so it's so fun talking about the history of the things that Sabina and I have made together. It's really it's it's wonderful. And is it three features or more? Is it, is it it's three? Yeah, it's three. It's three features. Features and we did a, a, one small project mm -hmm. uh, for media. Yeah, for me, but it, but it's, it's wonderful. The things that, that, that sort of the things that stay the same, the things that change, but the things that stay the same. And, and from the start, it's always been about creating scenes and being concerned with characters mm -hmm. and finding the emotion. And, and one last thing that come, we come back to this idea of time. And I was thinking about it. I think one of the reasons that I, one of the things that I think both of us are always looking for is the experience somehow capturing the experience of time passing mm -hmm. in, in a film. And that's not always easy. You sort of want, you want this thing, you know, if you listen to a great piece of music, like the Goldberg variations, what's so wonderful about it is, you know, there's a piece, a little aria that's played in the beginning and all these variations happen. And then the same aria is played at the end, but you feel totally different about it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's what both of us are kind of, we, we, we're we we are both seeking that that feeling that when you watch a film something shifts inside inside something well, shifts you, the, in you. you know it's interesting because you have the credit roll at the beginning or the credits and then you see them again at the end and you have a different whole other feeling some author if you have sure. a really great experience about those same names and those roles that they they had on on making this incredible film you just finished watching so maybe it's, you know that's a true a, a parallel um with, uh, true anyway um nice talking to you both thanks great. adam 
Great talking to you. Yeah, no, I'm so glad also to bring Nathaniel on finally, because it's been my intention for a long time. Oh, this is wonderful. By the way, did you enjoy the musical score? We had such a wonderful time with Paul Leonard Morgan, the composer. He he did such a beautiful job. Yeah. Um, It just, it's, it's such a wonderful experience to be able to work with a really, a really great composer. You know, that's, um, because you have your temp score, you know, and you, you love it. And, and well, you fall in love with it. And and then, yeah, right. And then, right, Sabina, wasn't that a wonderful, I mean, it's, it's, that was really a great. Yeah. Thus spake Zarathustra is probably, you know, just a temporary score, but they kept it on that. Right, level. but they kept it. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank uh, goodness. Yeah. Uh, anyway. All righty. Well, I'll let you guys, you know, I'm sure you've got other. People. Where um where are you uh is is your thing now because you're recording it now I mean you used to be only radio but now you're recording it is it a YouTube channel or how do you yeah yeah so hopefully I I, I hope I would try to make that clear to the publicists um I can never remember if I was but I I say I I put it on the YouTube channel and then the intention is of the podcast possibly you know because it's what I can I can do this in real time I can have this up and you know include the trailer which is really nice it's very visual obviously so you know it's it i think it can be more effective then i do clips and i'll post clips from our conversation sometimes i'll put it like some trailer over the clip you know as you're talking it's so it's actually really i find this much more liberating way of it's just a matter of people are actually going on youtube but i still do the podcast and i i'll take you know certain some of the conversations i do and I'll, you know, extract the audio and I'll clean it up and I'll make a podcast episode out of that every Friday. So actually Janet Pearson, I think, was on t- today. Yeah. Was she? Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And and there's a YouTube video. Do you know with when her we're going to be on? When are we going to be on? I'll play. Maybe I'll just do it at, like once the festival starts in the first. Oh, wait, it's so short this year. So, no, I'll it try to do it before that. It's only five days. So I, 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 I was still in the mind that it's like nine days long. Thank you. Right. But I'll, no, I'll do it leading up to the festival um, over the next coming days and probably post over the weekend a little bit. I don't know which day exactly, but I'll sh- certainly share it with uh, Susan and Jared. So, they, you know, okay. and I can. I can. Perfect. And uh, you okay, have the 11th of April in your calendar, by the way, just as a side note for the uh, doing the memorial thing on Zoom, too. Oh, yes. Did I send you oh, that? Zoom. Yeah, you did send it to me. Okay. If yeah, you if you're Zoom. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, we're. I, it's been here. a year. I, <laughs> That's, I just, uh, you know, I got to do it. I, w- I was hoping last year we'd we'd be able to do an, something in person much sooner, but obviously that wasn't going to work out. Anyway. Yeah. All righty, guys. Okay. Thank have you. a great. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah, you too. <laughs>